Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. This episode is sponsored by Trakel Art Supplies. For over 30 years, Trakel has been obsessed with the art of brush making, and now they're applying that same obsession to professional grade artist panels. Both their brushes and panels are made right here in California at their Hesperia factory. Go to Trakel.com and use promo code SAVVY16 to get 15% off your next order. Phyllis Schaefer is my guest today. Phyllis is an artist living right up the street from me in Tahoe, California. Okay, so maybe not up the street, but she's within two hours driving distance, and that is close enough for me. You may remember her name from the episode with Parker Stremmel. Phyllis is represented by the Stremmel Gallery in Reno, Nevada. Phyllis paints landscapes of Tahoe and the Eastern Sierras. She often goes out with her husband, who's a rock climber, and paints in gouache while he climbs. The landscapes she paints are distinctive, and they are unmistakably hers. Phyllis uses rich colors and has a quirky style that I am absolutely loving. In this episode, Phyllis talks about painting in gouache and her process for painting on site in a difficult medium. She also talks about living in urban areas versus more remote locations. Phyllis went to Lake Tahoe, which is a relatively small community in the mountains a few hours outside of San Francisco. And she originally went to teach painting at Lake Tahoe Community College just as a stepping stone, hoping that it would get her in a better position to teach in the city. But she ended up falling in love with Tahoe and making it her permanent home. 23 years later, she is still fascinated with the painting opportunities in the area. So without further ado, here is Phyllis Schaefer. Phyllis, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter Podcast. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk with you. Thank you, Antrice. Can you tell me a little bit about when you first started painting sort of professionally? Was there an artist that you admired when you were young that helped you decide that you wanted to be an artist? Well, I think I, that's that's looking back a very long ways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in a family where we always made things. There was sewing, craft making, all that kind of thing. So making things was something that just came very natural to me. When I was a senior in high school, I had a very inspiring art teacher. And maybe that's why I'm a teacher also. And it was probably then. So I was at the tender young age of about 17 when I, I really began to feel that my making of objects took on more importance. And it was sort of like a, a nun taking the vows, I think. I went off to undergraduate school in the fall of 1976 with a very serious mission, in my own mind at least. When I was in high school, this is interesting, but one of the greatest artists that I was enamored with was Andrew Wyeth. And I grew up in upstate New York. And so probably living in the Northeast in a rural area, his watercolors, egg tempers, they really spoke to me. And I was the president of my high school art club. Oh, wow. <laughs> we saved enough money that I think it was about 13 students from upstate New York. And I'm talking a rural upstate New York. I went to New York City and we went to the Museum of Modern Art and I saw Christina's World and I wept as I oh, looked at wow. that. So that set me on my way to a long and complex career of being an artist, I guess. Wow. Wow. That's fantastic, though. Like at that age to know Andrew Wyeth's work, I had at that age, I had no idea who he was. It, was, it would be like about five years later before I was introduced to him. It's the importance of a good teacher. Yes. Really? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about after, you know, so you'd made this decision to to be an artist. Like, I'd love to hear a little bit about when you just started out, maybe like if we could kind of put it into, to narrow it down for you a little bit, like after, you know, like in your 20s after college, what, what was your experience? So I went to undergraduate school in upstate New York, it was State University of Potsdam. And all of my professors said, that there's one very important thing. And that is you must live in New York City. And nothing counts unless you live in New York City. So that was their mindset. And so what did I do at the tender age of 22, but moved to lower Manhattan? Wow. And I, got a, I lived in a fifth floor walk up on the Lower East Side, and I was painting fantasy landscapes. So 
go figure. I grew up around landscape, and so landscape was something that was very important to me and meaningful on a very deep level. But here I am living in in the middle of the urban jungle. Yeah. Um, painting, yeah. Painting fantasy landscapes in a very surrealistic style. I did a cross-country trip with a girlfriend from New York to San Francisco, and I saw the Western landscape for the first time. And I also met a guy, which is the cause of many of our decisions in our early 20s, or maybe the rest of your life. I don't know. Most of them, yeah. Yeah, right? <laughs> so I went back to New York, put all my belongings in 10 boxes and UPS them to Oakland, California. And I lived in the Bay Area for 10 years, from 1984 to 94. And all of my landscape paintings really became full-blown living in the Bay Area. I feel like I sort of grew up artistically in the Bay Area. I showed in a lot of galleries, uh, had, was in a number of group exhibitions. And so probably one of the biggest aspects of my personal success would be that move to the West Coast and really embracing the Western lands. Ah, uh, nice. Okay, yeah, because that was sort of going to be the next question is, about a decision that you made that when looking back now, you think was really pivotal in, in your career. So would that, that be it, the move to San Francisco? Certainly, that's one of them. I think that our lives aren't always filled with big decisions. It's usually small decisions that pile up on each other. But so moving to the West Coast, certainly that was a, a huge shift in my development as an artist. I think the next big move was 10 years later, I was teaching part-time at various schools in the Bay Area, looking for a way to make a living as a teacher. I realized I was good at it. I liked it. I knew I did not want to teach K through 12 because I don't want anything to do with discipline. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'd been teaching at community colleges, uh, San Francisco State University, and I got a, a job description for Lake Tahoe Community College, which is part of the California community college system. This is strange. I lived in the East Bay for 10 years, and I never once drove to Tahoe in those oh, wow. 10 years. I was completely focused on San Francisco, the art scene, and the landscape of the coastal area. But um, So I got an interview, and I drove up to Tahoe for the first time, and lo and behold, they offered me the job. And about that time, I was in need of a change up in terms of the relationship situation. And so I packed everything and moved to Lake Tahoe. And that was 23 years ago. And I've been here ever since. Wow. Okay. Fantastic. Pretty crazy. Yeah, it's, it's so amazing. I don't know, when you look back at the things that pushed you to do something in your life that ended up being like a major change. But Tahoe is such a beautiful area. I know that area, not like the back of my hand, but I know it pretty, pretty well. And so you must have an enormous amount of inspiration from there. I do. And shortly before I moved to Tahoe, I had seen a show of plein air landscape painters from Sonoma County. And for whatever reason, these paintings were so full of life and so inspiring to me. And I came up through an art education that really frowned upon plein air painting. It was probably considered something that little old ladies did on a Sunday afternoon. So I had started sneaking out and painting outdoors. And then when I moved to Tahoe, there's nobody around to frown upon that. And I had these summers off living in, like you said, one of the most beautiful places in the world. And so I started to take my stuff outside and paint. So I kind of came to plein air painting through the back door. I uh -huh. started with with more fantasy landscapes. And now that they've kind of married themselves to direct observation, I think that's where you can see how my paintings come to look the way they do. Yeah, that I can see that. That's a good explanation of it. I'm kind of curious when you, you mentioned that when you moved to San Francisco, that's when you sort of grew up as an artist for lack of, I'm paraphrasing it. I, I think you said it much more eloquently. I just wasn't fast enough to write it down. Um, <laughs> but can you talk a little bit about that? What was it about San Francisco that, that changed your art? And what was your big takeaway from that move that pushed your art in a different direction? Well, the time was the 80s. And the 80s were 
as we all know, kind of a boom before the bust. Lots of people were buying paintings. Paintings were big, and there was a lot of neo-expressionism going on. And so the kind of work that I was seeing being done in the current art scene in the Bay Area was large, bombastic, thick paint images, definitely images in a very what kind of expressionistic style. And so I applied that to my own emotional response to the world as illustrated through the landscape metaphor, if that makes any sense. I was painting these big volcanic paintings, volcano shapes, and things kind of coming unhinged. And I know, I don't know, you probably know this, when you're in art school and you're also in your 20s and maybe early 30s, you're you're a lot more raw and things are very uh, intense. And so I used landscape as a metaphor for my own psychic state of mind, Mm. my own passage through this time that I was living in. So I'd see the land as a metaphor for my own interior life, I guess. And I always have, and that still continues today. The thing that immediately caught my eye when I first saw your work, and fortunately, I I was able to see the first time I saw it was actually in person. So (laughs) I think that made a big difference. But the paintings that I saw, you paint in gouache and you paint in oil painting and oil as well. I'm curious about your gouache paintings, because do you do those on site? Is that part of your plein air practice? I do, actually. And it's nice because the gear is so much lighter than oil paint. I have a palette that I have to carry like a pizza. You don't want it to slide sideways. So I'll hike out carrying this pizza-like palette, you know. But my husband's a rock climber. I'll often go out with the climbers. And while they're climbing, I'm painting. I, I know that that position that you're in. <laughs> my husband's a climber, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, a lot of us have that kind of. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great relationship. Climbers and painters make good yes. partners. <laughs> Yes, I've always painted in gouache. I don't know. I can't even remember. It's been so long. Back when I was in my apartment in the Lower East Side in New York, I was working in gouache. I think it's just sort of, well, one, it's easy because it's a non-permanent, it's like watercolor, but it's opaque rather than transparent. And so the thought process is very similar to oil paint, because if I want to get a pink, I add white to my red, just like with oil paint, whereas watercolorists are really thinking always about transparency and saving the white of the paper. And I've never really got the hang of watercolor, but gouache and oil seem to be just a nice relationship for me. And honestly, I think gouache is like knitting. It's so easy and so meditative for me. Whereas oil, I kind of have to work a little harder. That's amazing, because I wonder if it's because I've got lots of questions for you about the gouache, but I was introduced to gouache as a medium in college. And part of it was doing color theory exercises and doing very precise geometric color explorations. And one of the things that they wanted us to learn that we really focused on was not just color theory, but it was the execution and the craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. So we were supposed to, you know, paint all these geometric shapes and color scales without any streaks, without any bleeding, without any, any, I mean, they had to be absolutely perfect. So it's possible that because of that, when I hear about painting in gouache, I always like, have a little bit of a like, <laughs> oh my God, it's so hard. <laughs> right, know? right. It's crazy. That's insane because gouache is a different color when it's wet than when it dries. Yes, it dries much darker. And then if you run out of that color, you have a tiny, tiny chance, almost infinitesimal chance of ever matching it exactly. So yeah, but I, for some reason, I love gouache. And, you know, when I start my pieces, I start them more like watercolor. It's thin and very watered down, but then I layer and layer. And you can get probably, I don't know what, do you remember from color theory, like three or four layers before it kind of tops out. Yeah, and starts to crack. Mm -hmm. So I work thin to thick with the gouache. Okay, that makes sense. And I start them on location and then I finish them in the studio. So there's a lot more control in the studio. 
Got you. Okay. This is because that was, I mean, I'm so fascinated by this because I think washes to me, from my experience at least, and maybe when other people hear this interview, they might come back and say, no, Antrese, you're wrong. There's lots of people, but I don't see a lot of people outside of the entertainment industry using gouache. Where I find gouache is at museums where they have like early American paintings from like the 1930s and 40s. And Uh you're right, it was probably used in a commercial sense, but there's a lot of artists like, oh, of course, I'm going to lose some names now, but, and a lot of printmakers, Mm. printmakers from the 1930s would do a lot of their preparatory sketches in gouache before carving a block. William Rice, a printmaker from the early 20th century that hails from Oakland, California. And I saw a show of his at the Crocker Museum in Sacramento. Oh, wow. And there was a lot of little gouache studies. Anyway, for whatever reason, I seem to really be drawn to not only the the use of that medium, but also the look of paintings, landscape, American landscape paintings that come from the 1930s and 40s. Thomas Hart Benton, Grant Wood, the, uh, oh my gosh, how come I'm forgetting this? There's lots of them. It'll come around. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll come around. And, yeah, no, I do that. I do that often. You'll see me like start to say something and then want to reference something. And then I get this deer in the headlights moment. And four minutes later, I'll remember the artist's name or at three o'clock in the morning when it's and only completely gets useless. Worse as you get older, I'll, I'll just warn <laughs> you right now. <laughs> How did you start using gouache, though? Was it was it something you were introduced to in, in college and then continued to use? Or did you just discover this on your own through those painters? You know, I wish I could tell you, and I just cannot remember. I know in my design, cl- design and color theory class when I was in undergraduate school, we used acrylic. And I hate acrylic. I don't know about you, but it's just... <sighs> I use it for underpaintings and Do but you? I never yeah, okay. I don't when I'm in a hurry and I you know, or, or I just want to get something in quickly and I know I don't want to have to wait for the oil to dry. Yeah. But I know I know people who do amazing work in a, in acrylics, but it, it never Yeah. I mean and there's a lot of mediums you can add to it so it behaves a lot like oil. And I and if you went to school in the seventies, everyone was using acrylic. And then when I was at the state university in the 70s, I, I applied and was accepted for a program in New York City where all these students from different state universities in New York would go to this special program. And we had a loft in lower Manhattan. It was through Empire State College. And I met a painter. She was from Buffalo, which is where I'm born, actually. But we moved away from there. She introduced me to oil. And I struggled with oil for probably like a year or two with no guidance. That's the other thing. Education in the 70s was like very slim on technique, especially for middle class kids going to state universities. I was literally told, go and do it, and it better mean something to you personally. That's the only message I got. I never got any technique. I mean, I I had some drawing classes, figure drawing classes, and and luckily I knew how to draw on my own kind of. So I, I think now, and maybe we'll get to this, but I am a teacher. I've been teaching full time at Lake Tahoe Community College for 23 years. And so I teach the first two years of an undergraduate education. And I, I really, my teaching style is a direct result of maybe what I did not get in Mm. my own education. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And and I think, frankly, lucky for the students. (laughs) I guess. I mean, I think it's also that you can, you can find some programs where the education is so heavy on technique that no one ever, that you turn out painters that make paintings that look like everybody else's. Right, that's true. And I think that's that's erring on the on the opposite side. I think you've got to teach technique, but you've also got to teach the students to look at art history and also to find examples throughout history of something that touches them individually. And I also think you just need to dig personally into your own vision. Yes. And find whatever means to find your own voice if you're going to make any kind of an original image. Yeah. Yeah. And your work is, it's very, very distinctive. I think your, um, particularly your gouache work. I mean, there's, to me, there's no doubt Uh that's Phyllis. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah. And it's probably that kind of surrealistic fantasy style that I worked in before going outdoors. So Mm -hmm. it's really, 
I'm really a plein air painter that kind of came to this through the back door. Right, right. Well, I think what's beautiful about that is I know many artists kind of worry about what they're doing and switching gears and is this the right thing? You know, like, especially when you're when you're just starting out, definitely in college, but I think college, it's a little bit easier because you're kind of supposed to do that. Right, sure. And then when you get out, you're supposed to have it figured out. And so if you're going in a direction and then you realize that you need to switch gears and you're off, I think it scares a lot of artists. Certainly. But I think what's beautiful about your projection is that to me, it all comes to play. You know, it all feeds in. So there's no wasted time. There's no wasted periods where you were playing around with something. It all ends up adding to your unique thumbprint. Yeah. And I know there's a million ways to do it. But for me, it's always been about landscape and sort of the sensuousness of the medium or media that I work in. And I guess every step of my life is kind of just the path has maybe narrowed as I go. Mm -hmm. Until now, I know that, yeah, this is me. And this is, there's still plenty for me to explore that I think I've got my work cut out for me for the rest of my life. Yes, yes. I mean, and I think that's an interesting point. I think that's the beauty of of beginning to focus. I think you should start extremely broad and keep your mind open and allow for as many influences possible. But at some point, you have to make decisions. And if I remember correctly, the root word of decision or decide is to cut. And you know, it's has, oh. it's related to incision and, and cutting and cutting away. So it's, it's basically just saying like, okay, I am going to amputate that piece <laughs> and let right, it go right, so that right. I can move here. But I think that that focus opens up for so much freedom in the sense that when you really allow yourself to say like, okay, this is what I'm going to, to focus on, then you can get meta on it and dive in deep and explore and find things that nobody else would be able to find if they were doing it sort of superficially when you're in that broad macro. Sure. Right. And I think that that probably happens at different points for, for everyone. That's where graduate school for me was a real challenge because graduate school, you're not just absorbing undergraduate school. You're just absorbing everything that your professors have to give you. Graduate school, they're saying, cut off what's not necessary, you know, deepen your vision, find your vision, but oh, but play politics and do the tap dance for us or you won't get the degree. It was a very frustrating time for me and probably the time when I came closest to chucking it all oh. was in graduate school. Wow. Yeah. This episode is sponsored by Turkel Art Supplies. Brian Turkel started Turkel Art Supplies over 30 years ago from his apartment in Brea, California. Turkel sells direct to artists so that they can keep their quality high and their costs low. What I think makes Turkel special is that they're always looking for ways to develop relationships with artists so that they can serve them better. Here's an example from Brian himself. It's always allowed me a lifestyle where things are changing constantly. I, could, I don't think I could ever really work in, a, you know, in an office or a factory or anything because it gets too repetitive. And something new is always going on in this industry. When I was very, very, very small and actually started in my apartment in Berea, you know, I had a customer come over and we sat there at the coffee table and, and designed a new brush that she thought would really work. And 30 years later, she's very big and she still buys those same brushes. So, you know, those, those are the types of things that really are, are, are a lot of fun. Go to Turkel.com and use promo code SAVVY16 to get 15% off your next order. When you say you came close to checking it all... Um, like so it sounds like a, you reached a point where you were feeling like ah I'm going to quit. Can you talk a little bit about that and what was going on and what you were experiencing? I did my graduate work at UC Berkeley and the program in my opinion and I know this is going to go out and people are going to hear this. It was not a strong program, but there were strengths that I found within it and there were a few faculty that I found that that resonated with me, but overall and this is speaking as someone who's devoted their life to education, they could have done a much better job. But having said that, I got a job in the Art History Classics Graduate Library at UC Berkeley while I was there. 
And I began to get really into library work, believe it or not. And I loved it, the anal retentive part of me. And this was when Berkeley was, this is in the 80s, the late 80s, and, and they're transitioning from the card catalog to online. And so everything, you had to go into these databases and get all those millions and millions of books online so that people could access them. Uh huh. And at that time, UC Berkeley would have paid for me to go and get a Master of Library Science while I was working. And I seriously considered it. And I thought I could paint in my own time and be a librarian. <laughs> um, so that was one thing that was going on. And I, had, I was just very disillusioned with the art world and the, the politics in the art department. The other thing is that I, I did a lot of dance, kind of interpretive dance, never professionally, but I started when I was in, in undergraduate school. When I moved to New York, I danced with a woman named Simone Forti. I actually performed in one of her pieces in Soho. And then when I moved to the Bay Area, I continued to look for dance instructors or mentors or something. And so I thought, maybe I should be a dancer and give up painting. But the thing was, making images is so deeply ingrained that I could never give it up. And then while I had this job at Berkeley, I get my graduate degree, and I, my job at the library got upgraded to a supervisory position. So here I am like a in a supervisory position working in the Art History Classics Library. And then I applied for an artist residency. It's called the Jurassi Foundation. It's down near Woodside, California, on the peninsula south of San Francisco. And I got accepted. So I asked for a leave of absence and I went for three or four, was it four week, a four week residency where you have a studio and a bedroom and a chef that makes all your meals. Oh, oh, heaven, (laughs) heaven on earth. Anyway, at the end of that, I went back to my eight to five job at the library and said, this is intolerable. (laughs) I can't do this. (laughs) So I offered my resignation. And wow. uh, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And then, you know, I went back to doing what manual labor, painting houses, waitressing. Uh-huh. And then I, I started teaching because I had the degree. I got a little class here, a little class there. So anyway, that ended up in finding a full time teaching job. So that's a roundabout way of answering your question. So graduate school was a means to an end for sure. Uh huh. But I wonder, I mean, at this point today, I don't know that that this is kind of a, you know, an observation slash question. I don't know if that's really available any anymore. It's it feels like that used to used to be a pretty secure path to a teaching job at a, at a university or at the college level. And it doesn't seem like that's the case anymore, because two factors, the market is so saturated. It's saturated. And also, it seems like universities are switching to away from tenured professors to basically contract work. Well, and I mean, I had to leave the Bay Area and go to the hinterlands of Lake Tahoe for a job. I mean, probably at that time, I would have preferred to have stayed in the Bay Area because I felt like that was the only way I could make it as an artist was to be in an urban area. And so in a way, going, going to Lake Tahoe was just a way of securing a stable income. And I think that's so weird because I've so fallen in love with it. But my purpose in coming here was just to secure a, a steady income and get a get a line on my resume, really. Right. And, and I was sure I would be back in the Bay Area in no time and then be more competitive for a better job in an urban area. And then what happened along the way was that I fell in love with this area and I had all this autonomy. I'm the only painting instructor. Oh, wow. There's none of this backstabbing and horrible politics that you find in university art departments and art schools. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a community college, but you know what? I teach the same way with the same integrity and the same intensity as if I had been hired at the San Francisco Art Institute. And and to me, all I'm thinking right now is, and you get to live in South Lake Tahoe. Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> I can actually afford, I have, I could afford to buy a house, which you can't in the Bay Area. And Right, right. 
I don't know if you can afford Tahoe anymore, but <laughs> maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, I didn't mean that. About, I just mean the prices have like skyrocketed. Yeah. But well, that's really interesting. I'm curious. Yeah, life just throws things at you, and it's kind of funny what you think will happen versus what actually does happen. But I'm I'm curious. Was it difficult then? Because Tahoe, for people who don't know Lake Tahoe, it is a fairly a relatively small town, especially if you're comparing it to San Francisco. I get this question a lot about living in a small community and getting your work out and showing your work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. I'm curious, um, number one, how was it for you? And number two, if you have advice for somebody who's living in a small town and sort of experiencing that anxiety. Well, certainly it's going to be harder if you live in a small town. And if you're not in an, a major urban area, you're not going to those art openings. You're not meeting people. You're not part of that scene. When I came here, I had a, a sizable resume of work that I had done in the Bay Area. That, so that's one thing. I mean, I think when you're young, you probably should go to an urban area. But I meet tons of students who are like their moms. Uh, you know, I, I meet people who are parents who they're invested in staying here on a emotional level on a pragmatic level. And so I think that you just have to figure out the ways to still make it happen, which number one, you've got to have a stable lifestyle so that you can commit enough time to work, to develop that body of work that's really strong. And then you need to do the work. And with the internet and, and all this online stuff, it's a lot easier. You need to find outlets that are going to be sympathetic to your vision and for me, I had met a guy in Reno who had a little gallery and then he lost the gallery and he was doing sort of an online gallery and he would send out like a postcard each month featuring an artist. And then he would try and sell your work online. And he shot me an email saying, can you shoot me down some images of what you're working on right now? And this is back when I was still doing 35 millimeter slide slide images, <laughs> not, mm -hmm. not even digital. Mm -hmm. So this was like the, the late 90s. And I sent him image, I, I shot images of partially finished paintings, didn't even label, did nothing the correct way you're supposed to, and shot them in the mail down to him in Reno. And he took them over to Turkey Stremel and said, Turkey, you've got to see these paintings. And she goes, Frank, his name is Frank Hill. She said, Frank, I've already got enough artists. I don't need any more. And he said, no, come on, you got to look. And she looked at them and she called me that evening. And I know this sounds like, oh, lucky for you. It's this perfect story. <laughs> but Turkey called me and said, wow, I really like these. I'd like to look at them in person and maybe put you in a group show. So I took a bunch of stuff down and she said, I only want to see the oils. I don't want to see the gouache. And I took the gouache anyway. Mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, see these things. And she put about eight paintings in a group show in the fall of 1999, and she sold like five of them. I sold five paintings in my entire career prior to meeting Turkey Stremel. Wow. It was never really even a thing. I was trying always to show and to get critical attention for my work and all that. But this was the first time I'd ever gotten hooked up with someone that could sell. It did sell. And so I've now had six solo exhibitions in these, what is it, almost 17 years that I've been with Turkey in the Stremel Gallery. And she's awesome. I mean, it, she's amazing. She is a real promoter. I mean, I've been with galleries where the gallery owner gets drunk at the opening. Turkey Stremel is working the crowd. She, she is beloved in that community, and she's got connections. And the Stremel Gallery is a real center of culture in mm -hmm. the whole area and outside the area. So I'm really lucky. I'm really, really fortunate that I got hooked up with her. And it's been a great relationship ever since. And the six solo shows that I've done with her, each of them have been sold out before the gallery even opens the show. Wow. She has a list of collectors that are waiting. And then she calls them when the paintings come in prior to the show. And they come in and they select what they want. 
I know it sounds like a dream. Yeah, it's know, it's like which which I don't remember who it, who it was, but which Hollywood starlet supposedly got discovered sitting at a counter drinking yeah, a, right? whatever. Like I don't, you know that that's the stereotypical Hollywood story that gets everybody moving to Los Angeles and sitting in a a diner drinking <laughs> milkshakes. I mean, I used to listen to my professors at Berkeley tell stories and and you hated it because it's like, oh, easy for you, you know. And here I am, you know, grubbing a little at the bottom of the, you know. Yeah, easy for you. But how many decades of work preceded that? Exactly. And, you know, I said no to a lot of things in order to keep painting. And that's, that's the truth is you have to stay really focused and you have to really want it. And I remember at a point when my, and teaching at a community college is no gravy train. You were hard, and the smaller the school, the more you work. And I was teaching art history. I mean, survey level art history. And anyone with a master of fine arts degree knows you're in no way competent to teach art history with that degree. And yet it was part of my duties. And so I basically had to do my own master's degree of learning art history. I mean, certainly it's survey. It's not like anything really super in depth, but I've taught everything from cave painting to contemporary art. And I had to teach design and printmaking and all the painting classes and drawing classes and figure drawing and figure painting. And so I've taught probably like 17 or 18 different courses over these 20 years. Whereas anyway, you know, poor me, but I loved it. It was a great challenge. It's made me a better artist and I've had a great time combining both my teaching and my and my own art career. I know this might sound extraordinarily Pollyanna-ish, but <laughs> because I don't want to I don't want to imply that it was easy, but the silver lining in that is that you're kind of getting paid to get your own master's degree in art history right. and you could guide it yourself and make it your exactly. own. Like I think that's amazing and so cool and so fun. <laughs> I didn't live it, so <laughs> No, it, it's totally true. I keep saying and I get paid for this. And then, you know, here I am at the autumn of my career as a as a community college instructor and I taught for the first time a travel class to Florence, Italy in October of this year. And I was I was as scared doing this as I was the very first year I taught. It was very humbling to take 17 students to Italy and to lecture on art history in different museums and churches and I'm a newbie at it and I and I have a long way to grow to be good at that. And so for me, from now until I retire, the next challenge is to try and do more of these travel classes to Europe. Oh, how fun. I'm just, I'm really lucky that I, I guess I like a challenge. I like not feeling confident because I'm always throwing these things in my path. And I go, what did you get yourself into? (laughs) Oh, God, I do that constantly. I'm like, why you had it? It could have been so easy. (laughs) Oh, easy. You could have phoned it in. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But I love that you have that with, I guess, the new term for it is the growth mindset. It's the, the forever student that you're constantly throwing those challenges in your own own way and kind of forcing yourself to grow as an artist and an educator. And I'm sure that all that stuff that you do comes back into your own work, or does it? Oh, yeah, totally. Absolutely. Being a teacher has made me a much better artist, because I've had to teach the basics and perspective and, you know, how light falls on an object and color theory and, you know, and all that stuff. And I'm sure you know, I mean, everything you do feeds into your work. This, I mean, this blog that you have, I'm sure it feeds you enormously. Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah, for sure. Phyllis, I'd love to know because I know that you just finished up a show. You had a show at Stremel Gallery in November, December, correct? Yes, yes. So I know you're hot off the heels of that. But what are you working on right now? What are you obsessed with? There were a lot of new things in that show. A lot of firsts. There was the first Moonlight painting, so I want to do more. I want to do more paintings at different times of the day and night. And adding on to that, I want to also do paintings that are about different kinds of weather. So by moving in that direction, I think that what I'm really yearning for is paintings that are more emotional or or allegorical, 
rather than maybe just describing a certain place, I want these to be interior landscapes. And I think moonlight or strong winds or a storm or twilight, uh, those kinds of things are, are sort of where I'm beginning to think. Now, it's going to be hard because I haven't quite worked out the logistics. How are you going to be out at, in a snowstorm painting? Or painting in moonlight is pretty fun, actually. So that's, yeah. that's one area. Yeah. Yeah. You can't even color it as you only see the value. And that, that's pretty exciting. So I think what I'm interested in is maybe just exploring some different times of day, some different kinds of weather patterns, and see if I can work that into my language. So that's one of the things that I feel is sort of new. But the other thing is, I, I don't know if you remember seeing this, but there was a bird painting in my exhibition. And that was kind of a neat experience. I have a friend who introduced me to the curator of natural history at the Nevada State Museum in Carson City. And they have a giant taxidermy bird collection. Wow. Yeah. He let me bring all my painting gear in and paint from their birds. So it was a really fun experience painting from these taxidermy birds in the museum. And then partway through that, I realized I wanted to drop in a landscape and, and pretend that these birds were flying in the sky. And so I, I added more canvases to the original one, added some more birds, dropped in a fisheye landscape around it, and then put in this fantasy sky behind them. And suddenly it, it opened up like this is the next body of work. So it was interesting because that was the last painting that I completed for this past exhibition. Oh, that sounds so fun though. Yeah. <laughs> That's so exciting. So there's always more things to do. And then I did a five color linoleum block print for this show, which was really outside my comfort zone. I learned a ton. I worked with Three Fish Studio in San Francisco. They helped me to, with the printing. And so I think I want to get my own press and now start making printmaking kind of another part of my, my practice, my daily practice in the studio. Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. <laughs> so lots that's, to do. Always yes, lots to do. always lots to do. Phyllis, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. I'm, I'm so glad that I stumbled onto your work and that Parker Stremmel introduced me to you and I got to talk to you. It's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you, Antrice. I'm so glad you walked into Stremmel Gallery as well that day. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. I want to give a big thank you to Phyllis Schaefer for such a lovely conversation. And I also want to thank Parker Stremmel for both introducing me to Phyllis's work and for connecting us personally. And if you want to see the show notes for this week's episode, go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the podcast link. You'll find Phyllis's episode there and you can check out her work, which I highly, highly recommend you do. She is an amazing gouache painter. And if you've ever tried that medium, you will not be disappointed. One more thing I want to let you know, this year you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. The workshop, How to Develop a Relationship with the Right Gallery, helped several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop. So you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists pushed through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. And you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no, I'm putting air quotes there, she had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned, but more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. 
Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening.